So, um, and welcome to uh, another session of the West Cork History Festival 2021, which, as you may know, is digital um, this year. So, uh, in this talk, we're going to hear from Dr. Eva Brunoch, uh, who is speaking about um, military and imperial culture in 19th century Ireland, which fits in very well with one of our festival themes this year, which is Ireland and Empire. And uh, Aoife is an independent scholar um, and a researcher with a strong uh, expertise in Irish social and cultural history. She studied originally at UCC and then um, at De Montfort University in the UK. And um, she developed an interest while she was working at NUI Maynooth in uh, sort of class in 19th century Ireland. And from that developed her interest in the role the British military played in Irish social history. So I'm going to hand over to talk uh, for her to talk. Um, so the official title of her talk is In the Wars, Military and Imperial Culture in 19th Century Ireland. Thank you for joining us, Aoife. Thank you for having me, Victoria. Very pleased <laughs> to spout on about this ad nauseum. <laughs> Good, excellent. And we'll try and capture that. Okay. Uh, I should have said that Aoife blogs at irishgarrisonstown.com, which was recommended by the Irish Times um, as an absolutely excellent blog to follow. And uh, she's going to be talking about some of the research she's done that's fed into that blog. I definitely recommend you visit it um, as well. Um, in the blog, um, she explores aspects of the military-civilian relationship, ranging from riots um, to military cemeteries. And I just wanted to start by asking you, why was it that you chose the sort of urban landscape to look at how soldiers and civilians interacted in Ireland and how those urban areas are important for understanding this culture of interface between imperial and um, Irish experience? Well, one of the first reasons, I suppose, is that I actually come from a garrison town. I come from Cork City, uh, which has a huge barracks still in use uh, by the Irish army now, but which dates from 1801-ish. Um, and also, I've always been very interested in urban history, and I think it's a kind of a way of conceptualizing Irish society that maybe got a bit left behind in all of the dancing at the crossroads rhetoric that 20th century nationalism and earlier 19th century cultural nationalism tried to construct this wonderful urban or rural idyll that people were living in and that was authentically Irish. And so communities in urban areas, their culture really became a kind of a strange limbo like state that wasn't really Irish enough, but that was certainly there and you couldn't deny it because so many people lived in towns. And it was also driven by sources when I went looking at newspapers in particular, because newspapers are produced in the towns. The editor, editors and the journalists live in towns and they generally report on their local area. And so it was quite clear that these were very urban productions, these newspapers. And that was then further consolidated by when I went to look at maps. And I'm just going to share my screen now and show you some of the map information that I found really interesting that really brought the idea of garrison towns really to the fore. And in this case, this is a map uh, from the late 19th century of Newbridge. And Newbridge is actually the dictionary definition of a garrison town because the town itself didn't really exist until this barracks was built in 1815. So it's unusual in that sense, this enormous barrack was positioned on the ford here because it was useful to water horses and it's cavalry barrack and the town then grew up around it so you can see that very clearly from the map where the barracks is on one side of the road and everyone else lives on the other and it's a very distinctive looking urban um, arrangement but the interesting thing is that just down the road from where I live in Ballancolly, County Cork they have more or less the same structure with an enormous barrack dominating one side of the road uh, leading down to the river and then the um, town on the other and Ballancolleg is a pre-existing town it was there long before the barrack was built now it is of course founded around the, um, the gunpowder industry there which is on one side of the road so there are these legacies in these towns and that are very clear and obvious to see even today um, even in the arrangement of urban space but I think all of us living in Ireland will recognize that the term garrison town is much bigger than places like Newbridge or Balancholic. It's a kind of a frequently used term. I mean, I've heard people use it in restaurants in cafes, you know, people talk about it. So it does have a bigger meaning 
And this map from Cork really shows, I suppose, the scale of a barrack in an urban area and why we might use the word garrison town and how it would form the, the place around it. This is Cork City and it's 1832. And you can see on the right hand side of the map underneath the um, compass star is the barrack. And its scale is really quite enormous on this map. It's a really good map for demonstrating just how big the barracks were, even in the context of 19th century institutions. There are a number of other institutions on this map over to the left hand side. There are two jails. Uh, one is the city jail, which you can have visit as a tourist attraction. And down below is the uh, county jail, which has since been demolished and replaced by UCC. And these are quite large structures, really, in the landscape, but you can see how tiny they are compared to the barrack. And the barrack at this point, this is the second barrack the Cork City has been given, really, by the state. Uh, and the first one is so small that we can't really see it easily on the map. It's on Barrack Street. Um, and these new barracks from the late 18th to the early 20th century represent this kind of new military strategy. And the huge square in the center is for the revolutions and maneuverings of troops and the training. And that's why they are this very distinctive shape and why they are so enormous. They start off in Cork, they hold about a thousand people and up to 800 horses at the beginning. But really by the end, as the complex expands, it can hold up to 2000 men. So it is really big. Um, and garrison towns, I think, are very influenced by this enormous concentration of military men. Um, they are places where military culture is distilled and concentrated and on display throughout the, throughout the day. Um, soldiers <clears throat> at this point aren't allowed to wear civvies, so they can only leave the barrack in uniform. So we have to imagine something that's quite difficult, I think, for us to envisage now is the streets just full of soldiers in uniform, just normal. Um, that doesn't really happen anymore because of the size of our armies and the regulations around military life. So the material culture of places like Cork is shot through with these sorts of hints of empire. And of course, Cork is also a port city and it helps provision the Navy in the 18th century. So there's all of these other overlapping legacies of empire. But I, the reason also I chose garrison towns is not just the numbers of men involved, but also how it brings the empire home in a really lived and embodied experience. Um, because of all of these people who've had experience of empire, who are bringing the material culture and the slang and the language and the experience of living abroad. I think these places deserve uh, consideration in how that militarism feeds into civilian life and what it means. And it's important in terms of the army for Ireland because the Navy isn't particularly heavily concentrated here. The Navy is really envisaged much more as an English kind of arm of the forces and is part of a very patriotic Englishness and is very concentrated around Plymouth and Portsmouth um, and even the provisioning of the Navy in the eight, in, which is huge for Cork in the 18th century starts to leave the city as they change the way that the Navy is uh, supplies itself with goods. So places like Cork that were once a balance of Navy and Army uh, influences become much more army in the 19th century. And I think that that's something that's quite significant and that we really need to consider as to how the culture of nationalism evolves and how that relates to uh, pollination by ideas from empire or opposition to it. Um, because Ireland is a, a recruiting station and also a training station. The reason these barracks exist is that they are for training troops. Ireland is a very important base. The British don't like standing armies. They have a kind of a constitutional fear of a standing army, but the reality is an empire needs one. And so where are you going to keep it? Well, you keep it where sort of no one can see it. And as we know in the weird Anglo-Irish relationship that still exists, Ireland is a strange blind spot in the English political mind. 
So technically, the English don't have a standing army because it lives in Ireland. And it is also, up until the famine, a largely Irish army as well. So there's all of these ways in which these garrison towns are places that supply soldiers and also places that supply goods and places that experience the performance of militarism and imperial identities in these armies and these regiments. So I think that's why it's important, the recruiting and also the domestic response to the garrison itself. That's really interesting. I love this idea that they're sort of parked in a way. You've got to park standing troops somewhere. So yes, offshore. <laughs> yes, I mean, in, in a way, that's true. They, they, they can become invisible if they're not in London, of course. I mean, London is interestingly a garrisoned town as well, but they're very small garrisons, they're very small barracks, and they're primarily there to protect the Queen or the Houses of Parliament. They perform a different function within British ideas of empire. Um, but the Irish, Irish situation, I think, is worthy of kind of consideration within Britain and perhaps has been neglected by historians of the British Army because they focus on the front line so much. It's not the front line. It's a home station, but a different kind of home station to England. Yeah. Um you talked about soldiers on the streets, I and mean, it's very interesting the fact that they're wearing uniforms, so they're very identifiable. But this um, this idea of the framing, bringing an understanding to imperial culture in 19th century Ireland, you talked about that a bit more. I mean, how does that manifest itself on a kind of day-to-day -day basis in terms of civilians and soldiers interacting? Well, actually, I have a, a lovely illustration. It's from 1903, um, and it shows a regiment in its finery going through Cork City. Um, and this is obviously, you know, a special on fete day. There are flags, there's bunting, everyone's hanging out the window. Uh, there appears to be a, a nice decorated um, flower box there in the foreground, which is very funny because of course, one of the big legacies of Queen Elizabeth's visit to Cork City is these enormous flower pots that the council brings out every year because they bought them then <laughs> and they reappear. <laughs> every summer these big plastic flower pots so I think their money's know, worth <laughs> yeah oh absolutely they've never been as nice since i will say because they planted them so well when she came and they've been a bit mean with the plants ever since but like even stuff like that really shows you how something as simple as a visit by you know a member of the establishment can leave a legacy on the the street but these men here who are in absolutely like the top class, fanciest British army uniforms you can get. Um, they are an example. In this case, it's a, it's a festive day, but this is a normal daily sight in garrison towns. There are always soldiers moving around and because they must always be uniformed, this is what they look like. This is just normal. They are, in this case, uh, there's a visit, I think, and they are guarding everybody. Um, but even, um, even days, assize days, the judges are accompanied by full cavalry who look all fancy. And it's part of the performance of state in that context. But in the performance of empire, we have regiments commemorate their famous victories on a regular basis. So when they have been, um, you know, when they, they have these flags. I don't know if anyone has ever seen these flags. They still exist in some of the, um, some of the churches. Uh, if you go to Warwick, the church there has a little side chapel to the Warwickshire Regiment and it's covered in flags. So the flags often have um, names of imperial battles. So these are imperial battle sites that are consistently remembered at home so that there would be a special um, service on the day to commemorate the wonderful victory, whatever it was, wherever. Um, and on these service days, so within the barrack itself from the middle of the 19th century, there's a chapel uh, for the Anglican community, but for everybody who's a soldier who's not an Anglican, they go to church somewhere else. So the, in Cork City, the Catholic soldiers leave to walk down the hill to St. Patrick's, which is near the train station, if anyone knows Cork. Uh, 
So they walk down the hill in parade and they are preceded by a drum major and he's throwing a staff and everybody is beautifully dressed because they must be for Sunday worship, special days like going to church. And the same is true for the Presbyterians and the Methodists. Everybody has to be performing this vision of martial unity and victory. You know, these are very important ways of publicly manifesting the success of empire to people, to the idea of conquest, to how it might just be a casual everyday experience to be on the winning side. Um, and that's important in an Irish context when you consider Irish nationalism plays a lot on ideas of losing against the British army. But yet, fundamentally, there are these performances of success all the time. And there are also regimental dinners, which are hosted by uh, the officer class. So these obviously are, you know, restricted entry. Not everybody gets to go to this. It's invite only and you have to be posh. But that is a way in which the upper middle classes and the gentry are, who are outside the army are part of the social the social experience of the army and its commemoration and its successes in empire. So I think these kind of performances that are particular to the army really are an important way of experiencing culture and martial culture in particular. And there are celebrations for the queen's birthday. She has an official birthday, which is different to her actual birthday and there are reviews and parades and then there are various military maneuvers that have nothing to do with an event but which are showing how the army works and how it displays its power and how it trains so people's experience in a garrison town of the military was really extensive it's incredibly difficult to imagine it now i i just can't think of an alternative way of experiencing this Modern armies are extremely private. Everything goes on behind closed doors and you have to be given a pass to get in. But in the 19th century, the barrack was open. Journalists just walk in. They just walk in having a look, which is how they went in in Cork. I think they were checking out what the commemoration of the Battle of Waterloo was that year and they encountered a flogging. So it's a public space. It is not like what we imagine military life to be. And then there's, of course, music. There's musical recitals um, in the chapels or without. There's, it feeds into clubs like Masons. The Freemasons are big in the army. Um, there are cycling clubs. There are all ways in which, especially military masculinities, are feeding into civilian life. So I think it's... It's interesting that there are coverages of these events sometimes, like the Queen's um, official birthday occasionally will provoke sort of rowdiness and unrest, which in Ireland is always framed as a nationalist statement. Um, but I sometimes wonder because rowdiness and crowds are a problem everywhere and there are ways in which uh, the establishment can articulate dissent. And I think it's always interesting that the Irish chose the, you know, nationalist conflict as a way of framing these sorts of popular movements um, where people start throwing so stones at soldiers. That happens in garrison towns really across Britain, that there is conflict between soldiers and civilians. Um, but these great fete days of the empire are an opportunity as well for discontent within Ireland to bubble to the surface and to make some sort of a protest. So there's all sorts of ways I think that these public displays um, should be considered. And talking, you were speaking earlier about the sort of integration of upper middle class um, civilians into the sort of military way of life through Im invitations and that kind of thing. But I know a lot of your work is, is really framed in terms of class and, and status and not the officer class. Um, so how, how did the sort of the experiences of ordinary soldiers, how did they sort of feed into this imperial culture and their experience of it and bringing that back to their, to their garrisons in Ireland or to their home places if they were, if they were Irish? Can I just plug in my um, computer? <laughs> sure. I hadn't realized it wasn't plugged in. That would be a disaster. <laughs> 
Yes. Okay. So the ordinary soldier, I suppose, he's he's not a very sexy subject, it has to be said. Um, in recent years, a lot more attention is given to the sort of cultural and social significance of the ordinary soldier within uh, scholarly work. Military history has really been very interested in battlefield experiences, but it's now beginning to expand into uh, considerations of masculinity, what people read, why they read it. And I think the ordinary soldier is particularly interesting because there is so much focus within popular understandings of the British Army that the ordinary soldier was Irish. Um, and they or were a lot of Irish soldiers in the British Army. Um, as to whether they were recruited in Ireland, that's a whole other story. A lot of them come from the big cities in the UK. But it is a very interesting way of trying to approach the, uh, I suppose, proletarian angle to an incredibly status conscious organization. And they can be hard to find, these ordinary soldiers, but there is a kind of a vein of memoir writing within uh, the British Army that has recently come to the fore as, especially as texts are digitized, it's made a big difference. Now, these memoirs were previously not considered interesting because they don't feature war. The fascinating part about the empire, I suppose, is how many men can be part of the army and be abroad and be all over the world and never shoot at anybody or stab them or kill them. <laughs> so it's, it's quite remarkable when you think about it, but it just shows you the scale of the empire and also the numbers of soldiers that they have performing containment policing duties that don't actually involve active violence at any time. And one man um, I am particularly interested in uh, is this man, Thomas Faulkner, and he was from Leitrim originally. And he wrote a memoir called Stirring Incidents in the Life of a British Soldier. And spoiler alert, it's not stirring at all. He doesn't go to war once. He does a lot of traveling. There's a lot of moving between Gibraltar and Egypt, but you know, stirring, not so much. And this is from the frontispiece and it, he's portrayed as you can see in his medals and he's very respectably dressed. Uh, he was an NCO and he was a sergeant and his memoir is fascinating for all sorts of reasons. I could go on about him all day. Firstly, he joins in 1847 and it's May 1847 that he joins. And you're really going, May 1847 is the middle of the worst famine ever. And it is the worst time of the worst famine. The first six months of 1847 are catastrophic. Um, he didn't mention it once, actually. So <laughs> it's interesting how memoirs can construct ideas about Ireland as well. Now, he is pretty nationalist. He talks about how Ireland is oppressed by um, absentee landlords and, you know, there are many common nationalist tropes, but he certainly doesn't go to town on the horror of the famine. And he serves for 21 years. He's a long service uh, army man, which is quite common in this, this time period. Uh, when a man joined, he signed up for a defined term of years and he chose 21. And he served the full 21. He didn't get discharged or wounded um, or leave in that time. And he basically writes this extraordinary memoir of his life through the army. He's a very young man when he joins and he travels the world. He meets his wife. He has kids. It's, it's a life lived in the army. And then he leaves in 1868. He's discharged in Scotland. And he has this most amazing sentence where he says, I parted with the 6th Regiment and my coat with the deepest sorrow and lost my regimental home and friends. And I just think there's something so moving about that. It's not actually a very sentimental memoir by the standards of the 19th century, but his talk even of his coat, the clothing that he wore every day for 21 years was military and he had to leave all of that behind. Um, and also his home, the regiment could become a home and it was envisaged the ideal within the British Army 
was that the regiment would become a domestic space, a sort of a substitute family. And that's part of the reason they exclude biological families in order to strengthen the tie to the regiment. But it's clear that it is true for Faulkner. I mean, he had no relationships with people in Leitrim anymore. He was 21 years away. He had never lived anywhere else apart from Leitrim before enlistment. So his friends and his peer networks are entirely within the 6th Regiment and within, I suppose, more broadly within the army as a culture, within uh, men who have experienced that type of life. And there is a commonality between regiments as well. So he can't actually leave straight away. One of the first things he does when he gets a new job is he becomes a mess servant in a militia. And the militia are the part-time army. Um, the modern equivalent in Ireland today is the FCA. So they just embody for a few months a year and train and then are discharged again. So he kind of goes into like a lower level version of military life and he becomes a mess servant. And this wasn't uncommon for um, men of good standing who were officers like NCOs within the army because they had such good references. They were clearly disciplined. Uh, NCOs were not drinkers, that's the whole point. Uh, they have good conduct badges and good references. So he's able to get a job within another military context, really. Um, and then he eventually, after a very short time, actually toddling around Scotland, looking at things and deciding what to do with himself, he moves to Canada. And this memoir is actually published in Canada. So he's still within the empire um, and is experiencing, I suppose, the benefits of having been a good soldier because he becomes a hotel owner, I think. And he is a, a kind of a charming writer for the first two thirds of the book and it's well worth reading. And men like Faulkner, I think, are the sort of men who were able to leave their memoirs behind. He has so, a lot of issues around that he didn't get paid enough, that he isn't on a good enough pension. So it's partly that, but it is a homage to how wonderful his life was in the British Army. And the stirring incidents, although he's overselling it, it's like a tourist memoir. If you want an account of traveling the world, these are really interesting from the point of view of ordinary uh, lower class, so to speak, although he is literate. He does write and he does read and did before he joined the army. And I think men like Faulkner are worth considering within the story of the British Empire. They're relatively ordinary, but there are far more of them than there are of the officer class. The officer class, of course, leave lots more memoirs behind because it's almost a cottage industry. You were, you're related to some posh family who joined the army, you write a memoir about pig sticking. And they are very interesting in their own way, but they perhaps don't offer a, a, a perspective on the ordinary soldier because of the stratification within the army. And does that's he why articulate, I, does he articulate in any way the imperial imperial ideals, or does he feel like what what does he talk about what he's fighting for, or doesn't he? Does he just kind of get no? He never <laughs> never talks about anything big. He does describe the canals he's seen and the trees and the being on the boat. So it's it's you know it's the empire through the consumption almost of tourism. He's almost like a tourist. He is at the, I mean, he is at the serving in the British Army at a time when, I mean, if you want to, to really experience the sharp end of being a military man in India, you know, 1790s, 1910s is really when, like, they died like flies. At this point, when they're going to uh, very hot colonial stations, they have learned how to not die as, as often. They don't exercise in the midday sun with quite the extremity that they did earlier. They now know like you must boil the water and they have acquired some skills institutionally and that there is better medical treatment also within the army at this point. There's a proper medical corps which didn't exist in the uh, before about the 1830s There's very little medical care. So you don't really get a sense of that difficulty of empire. 
and the engagement with the climate or the people as hostile. This mm. is very comfortable. He's got a quite a nice life. They play music. He goes for walks with his wife. It's grand. Now, I think his children are sent home. And I think that's quite common that if they could afford it and they had family, uh, service families would send children home in order to escape the movement with the army. That um, segues quite nicely into two other things I really want to talk about with you, one of which was um, your work about the, the sort of service families, the wives and the children, um, and what happened to them, when, you know, did they travel around? I know there was only limited room on ships. And what about when they were widowed or left at home alone? Yeah, the, the service family is a difficult thing to find, partly because the... Um, the army is so determined not to pay attention to them because they, if once you pay attention to them, they cost money. So if you try and ignore them within the bureaucratic structure, then you don't have to pay them. Um, but they, they do exist in quite substantial numbers. And in, I think they go under the radar because of the regimental system within the British army. I think that's an important point to note in the engagement of people like Faulkner and his wife is that you join a regiment which is run by a commanding officer and which does fulfill um, various general rules that are issued by the war office but really the commanding officer and the officers under him have great latitude in how the daily life of a barrack works and especially how you treat women and children within that so although that there are there are rules there's a template to the day everyone gets up at the same time in the british army and they all get the same amount of food the treatment of women and children and families does vary. Um, and there is this, I think, I want to talk particularly about one case study that I really like. Uh, her name was Bridget Kent. And she would have met her husband in a situation like this, actually. So I imagine her to be uh, the lady in red there uh, behind the tea canister, having a chat to the man in front of her because Bridget Kent met Joseph Dowling in her father's pub in Fomoy. She was obviously working there. And Joseph Dowling was a sergeant. Um, and he was a young man, man from Kildare. And they got married in 1876. So this picture is from 1894. I don't think it's too far out really in what it would have looked like. And I think part of the attraction of the military man for the military for the uh, civilian woman is demonstrated by how beautifully dressed these soldiers are in comparison to the slightly tatty looking civilians around them. Um, now they are very, they're clean shaven, of course, and their hair is cut, so they have that, but they are also standing in a very particular way. Uh, the man in the center with his knee uh, to one side kind of propped up like that, if you look at pictures from the Crimea, even the men standing around tents in the Crimea will stand like that. It is a very particular manner that they are adopting. And it, it does accentuate their very tight trousers and the stripe down the side, um, and also the buttons up the front of their jackets. They are very well turned out. They would, I would think, be cleaner than the average than the average civilian because they're forced to be. Uh, their laundry is done twice a week, their undershirts are washed. Um, and they are quite attractive looking individuals within the spaces that they occupy. And Fromoy is a very heavily garrisoned town and has two large barracks. So if you consider the town itself is only an average sized town and it has a, two barracks that can hold a thousand men in each, you're talking 2000 men in a small town that whose population is probably only about 4,000 anyway. So Bridget Kent would have been very familiar with meeting men like this in the pub. So, but she marries a sergeant and I think a sergeant is important because they have much better living conditions and they have much better access to uh, living conditions for their wives and children. A sergeant can marry with permission from the commanding officer and so Bridget Kent could join the army effectively. So she becomes uh, a wife on the strength, which means that she is able to travel with her husband at the expense of the regiment. So she moves around the world with him. Um, 
And her history shows you, I think, how an ordinary person from a middle class, lower middle class background can end up traveling to Bermuda, Nova Scotia, Malta, Gibraltar, and Egypt. But the only reason we know this is not from the military records, but because she appears in the census and her children's birthplaces are listed. So you can tell where she was based on where she gave birth. She gave birth many times and didn't lose any of her children, which is an extraordinary achievement, but also shows, I think, you know, this is the later 19th century, they are, the conditions have improved hugely. And the on the strength wives are looked after in a way that their predecessors in 1810, in 1810, a woman accompanying her husband to Bermuda was unlikely to come back realistically. Um, but this is a different army. And she is, as you will have noticed, her name is Kent, and she is related to the Kents in Formoy, uh, who are famous, of course, for their republicanism in the 19, 1916. And I have, you know, there are members of this family who are very interested in the republican and nationalist and Fenian side of their family history. And Bridget's relations, some of them were Fenians. And it is interesting to consider how she represents um, just the ordinary conflict within families that who knows what she really thought about the military. Was it a job? Was it a calling? Did she love the army? We don't really know. Um, maybe she believed in Fenianism and the British army and the empire at the same time. <laughs> it is possible people can be conflicted. Um, and I think Bridget's experience shows how empire can be just a normal part of everyday life. She herself sort of leaves the army when her husband becomes a pensioner. He, like Falkenan, then joins as a mess servant in his own regiment. So he continues to be a military man. And he actually leaves her and her family in Fumoy and goes to India, where he dies. So she never sees him again. But she remains in Formoy and returns to her family occupation of a pub. And she opens uh, a pub right next town, literally two doors away from the gate. And so she is still really part of the military economy. She is serving soldiers um, and she makes, she makes her living that way. And one of the really interesting things about her family is that uh, her eldest son, Albert, joins the army as well, which isn't uncommon. Military children fre frequently continue within the army. And he joins and goes to World War I, but he's a career soldier, so he's not, he's not the conscription army or the, the new recruits to World War I. Um, and actually, he features in the examiner. They put a picture of him in the examiner because he's captured along with uh, a number of, of his colleagues and they're in the prison camp. And there was a picture of them in the examiner saying that he went to the Christian Brothers School in Formoy and look at him now, he's off in Germany in a prison camp. Um, but he represents, I think, something that we don't like to consider, which is the idea that joining the army is a kind of a family business for some people. And it can be into the 20th century, a family business as well. Um, and Albert, actually features in him earlier before he's uh, fully grown enough to become a, a military man. He uh, was obviously in a pub situation like this with, with his mother behind the counter and the soldiers coming and going. And he was befriended by some of the soldiers from the barrack. And they actually persuaded him to uh, effectively steal from his mother. His mother in her dresser upstairs in her bedroom had gold doubloons. And these doubloons were a legacy of her imperial adventures. She had gotten them in Malta when she was posted there. One of her children was born in Malta. And these doubloons, the soldiers persuaded poor innocent Albert that he should uh, trade them in for cash. And so they brought them to the local jeweler without him present, uh, got them valued, took the money and gave him a portion of it. And so, I mean, she effectively lost really her nest egg, which must have been an extremely traumatic thing. But I found the idea that she had this gold from her travels 
fascinating. It's quite likely she was able to establish her pub and buy her license because she had the proceeds of empire in a small little package, portable wealth, you know, as a result of traveling through the world where gold was easier to acquire, maybe it's cheaper, who knows how she got that money. Um, but I think it's just an example of the, the ordinary uh, legacies that ordinary families could bring back from what seemed to be impossibly distant and exotic destinations. But yet yeah, here she is in Formoy with a box and her dresser full of gold doubloons. I just love that detail. I think that's wonderful. One of our other speakers, Bryony Willis, is going to talk about sort of colonial objects in Irish homes, and that speaks directly to that. The kind of, well, I mean, I suppose gold was was a precious thing, but people must have brought back souvenirs, things they'd found or liberated, or you know, I mean, we talk about sort of imperial loot, but homes must have been full of sort of things that had come back mysteriously from India or um, you know colonial Africa, uh, which just might have been ordinary everyday objects to people, but in fact had this very complicated histories. Yes, and there's another image I have here. This is um, Kilmainham, the reading room in the Royal Hospital. Now Kilmainham, of course, is a military institution, so it's OTT and it's as bling and it's a, about military loot. But you can see on the walls they have spears and various shields and helmets and all sorts of military paraphernalia. And these kinds of things would also have been in homes, maybe just one, you know, maybe one spearhead from Africa, maybe just this little hint of the military exploits of the empire in these far flown lands. Um, they would never have approached the theater of this or, I mean, we're familiar with this sort of excess from the big houses as well, where the walls are covered in tiger heads and there are skins everywhere. And, but that excess, I think we have to consider there may be just one or two objects in a home of an ordinary soldier um, and which over time, I suppose, they just got thrown out. So a lot of it was lost and maybe just traded in for cash and it's now on the open market. But I think that ordinary people who were serving in ranks that aren't very sexy and their names will never be known and we won't have a genealogy for them. They are part of this uh, transfer of objects from far flung countries of the empire back into the home center of the empire in Ireland and Britain. Absolutely, and they're not just confined to big houses or museums as we would perceive it now with their colonial objects. Um, another kind of question when we're looking at the pensioners at um, the Royal Hospital in Dublin, um, and you spoke about the gentleman earlier who retired to Canada, but many people must have retired back to Ireland. Our sort of um, images in our mind of, of former British soldiers during the IRA, but also um, men with First World War service who didn't feel they could talk about it in post-independence Ireland. How does that sort of figure back into the 19th century with the people you're studying and how they settled back into, into home as it would have been, even if they'd been away for 25 years? Yeah, pensioners are a really interesting aspect of the afterlife of the British Army outside the barrack wall. I mean, these lads here, these are all old and grizzled, as you can tell. Um, and Chelsea and Kilmainham are, you know, famous for their in pensioners in these outfits. And that they kind of, in a way, I think they've obscured the reality of what pensioner meant within the British Army. The in pensioners in Chelsea and Kilmainham are a tiny fraction of the men receiving pensions. And most of them are what's called out pensioners so that they don't live within these semi-military barrack situations and they don't wear uniform. So they're just ordinary dudes living out there on the street. Um, and the really quite sad thing, I think, is that most of them are extremely young. Uh, very few end up serving the full 21 years. Um, and that's due to a number of things. They're constantly contracting the army due to um, cost. So anytime there's a constriction on the national finances, the army budgets are cut. And so they tend to let people go. I mean, you can get fired from the army in the 19th century. Um, so even if your term of service isn't up, you'd be fired. Um, but one of the more important ways I think that 
they are pensioned off is because they're disabled by their service. They are physically damaged by their work abroad. Um, and there's one really poignant example I found, a man called Patrick Reardon, and he joined the army when he was about 19, and he joined from Cork City. He joined the 61st Regiment in uh, 1845, and he goes to Bengal for one year and 10 months. And he is discharged after just, two, just barely three years service because he's unfit for further service. So at 22, he's out in his ear, really, you know, having possibly thought he was going to serve for life. Now, he had a good character and a good conduct, and he can write. So he's not entirely without skills. He's also a tailor. Um, but the description, I think, in, in these service records, these pension records are used a lot by genealogists, obviously. But I think we could use them to explore the soldier's body and the marks that they bore as a result of service. Um, when he arrived in India, his left hip began to hurt him. And after the year and 10 months, he couldn't walk without crutches because his left leg was three inches shorter than his right. Now, it's not really clear why this happened to this particular man. And obviously, the diagnostic tools of 1847 are, you know, not what we would like. But I think his story just shows you how he could pay the price of just ordinary service. He wasn't in conflict. And um, the service records will always tell you when they were in a battle. So he saw no military battles. And he was on a pension for about a year and a half as an out pensioner. Um, and during that time, he had to apply three times for it to be extended. So he is still part of that bureaucracy of the army. In places like Cork and everywhere, if you were an out pensioner, you signed up. It's a bit like the dole when you go to the dole office and you sign on for social welfare. They are involved in the same sort of bureaucratic haggling that modern social welfare recipients are familiar with. So he had to go and when he was discharged and he went back home to Cork, he had to go and say he was living in Cork to receive his pension there. So it's paid to him in Cork. Uh, if he liked, he could move anywhere he wanted within the British Isles. You can see the pension records show that men move from Jersey to Drogheda to Dublin. It's a fascinating insight into the mobility of lower class, but still, I suppose, fortunate men and they have a pension. Um, and eventually, as I said, after a year and a half, he's refused his pension. So he can't really walk. At 22, he can't walk properly and he has no pension. And he's not an unusual case. There are men who are discharged for all sorts of reasons, sometimes because they have bad character. Uh, Reardon had a good character, so he was given the pension for that short time. Um, but men who were addicted to vice, as they like to say, or who were uh, drunken, prone to drunkenness, wouldn't necessarily get any money at all, even though they would also be discharged with things like swollen varicose veins, um, all sorts of after effects of their work, because their work is always outdoors. Soldiers spend a lot of time walking and standing outdoors. And the effects of that on even men who are young and fit when they're sent abroad, it just shows you the kind of the ripples through uh, the bodies of men who serve. Um, and it shows, I think, that they are, they are still trying to be part of the imperial project by all of this pensioning business. They're not totemic figures like these men in Chelsea or Kilmainham. It is... Chelsea and Kilmainham is like the poster version of what pensioning was in the British Army. That's the glossy propaganda version. Most pensioners are not like that. Um, and I think that the cost that many ordinary people paid in invalidism from the army is something that we don't consider in the 19th century. And really, even to this day, really, the idea that one would be broken physically by your military service, is it's a hard sell, you know, people find it difficult to understand. Um, and so really, even before, if we want to talk about issues of exclusion and boycotting, 
there were very serious consequences for men who were uh, enlisted in the British Army in the 19th century. Which weren't necessarily political, but physical and uh, Yeah, absolutely. The, the physical consequences for every one of these imperial adventures were, were often severe. You know, it's something that it's, it's easy, I suppose, to talk about the, the political and the rhetorical and the ideological baggage that comes with empire um, and how men and women would bring home ideas about racism from their service abroad. I mean, people like Bridget Dowling experienced the army as a white woman in Bermuda. You know, she knew how race worked at the coal face in the colonies. Um, and it's inevitable that some of that will come home. But also women like Bridget Dowling lost their children in places like Bermuda and buried them in cemeteries and then came home and never again saw their graves. So there's all sorts of ways in which the dislocations and the exploitations of empire manifest themselves in those who served it. That's a good point to finish, although I could go on, Aoife. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I really appreciate your time and um, what a fascinating discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria.